Jesus is Lord. Welcome, brothers and sisters. My name is Father Al Lauer. This is Daily Bread. And we're in the midst of a series of teachings on how to heal as Jesus healed. And today we're going to talk about healing and forgiveness. I believe that in the next few minutes you can hear something that will open the door for literally hundreds of people receiving healing, including yourself. So we're going to not only teach, we're going to praise God, we're going to worship God. We have a few of our studio audience who's going to join me in worship, and then we're going to uh, get into our teaching. So would you join with me? We're going to pray now in the name of Jesus, wherever you are. Maybe you should stand, maybe you should uh, bow your heads, maybe kneel down or whatever, but let's begin to praise God, okay? We're just going to sprinkle everyone with this holy water reminding us that we are children of God that we've been baptized into God's family, we can worship our Father, we can worship Him in spirit and in truth. So we begin to praise and thank the Lord. We're going to sing the Our Father, and we'll explain why in just a little bit. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We praise you, Father. Thank you for adopting us and making us your Father. Thank you for loving us so much as to send your, your Son, Jesus. Whoever believes in him will have everlasting life. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Oh, Lord, we love you, we praise you, we adore you. Alleluia, alleluia. You are wonderful, Lord. You are holy. We praise you, we thank you, we adore you. Alleluia, Lord. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, hallelujah. Praise and honor and blessing belong to you, Lord. You are wonderful, you are holy, and we love you. Alleluia, alleluia, Lord. Alleluia, Lord. So let's pray now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. And also with you. Thank you. Let's ask the Lord's forgiveness. We're going to talk today about healing and forgiveness. And many people watching this program are sick, and the only thing that's blocking their healing is they have not received God's forgiveness or they have not given God's forgiveness. I'm going to kneel down for a minute myself, and I'm going to um, ask maybe some of you to join me. This is an expression of repentance. So let's come before the Lord and let's ask the Holy Spirit to convict us and to search our hearts and bring us to true repentance. Jesus, thank you for shedding your blood to take away our sins. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Jesus, thank you for dying so that we might live forever. Christ, have mercy. Christ, Christ have mercy. Jesus, thank you for your presence here. Thank you for being with us always, even unto the end of the world. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Please pray. Now, I believe some people have terminal cancer, and it's going to be cleared up in just a few moments. I believe some just have, some, they don't know they have anything serious, but it's going to develop into something serious, but it can be stopped right at this moment. Are you ready? Father, we pray in the name of Jesus. We just ask that each person listening to this program would totally commit his or her life to you and to your son Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask that we might live not for ourselves but for you, not to do our will but to do your will. Oh, Lord, right now, we ask that you would confirm this word with cures and signs and wonders. There are skeptical people, but as they feel healing going through their whole body, they will say, yes, Lord. Jesus, my Lord, my God, my all. Satan, we throw you out and we bind you, Jesus. You just be Lord of these next few moments. You just be Lord of every person watching this program. Jesus, we ask you to have some people tune the program in because you want to get a message to them. We pray all this in Jesus' wonderful name and through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Amen. Amen, brothers and sisters. We're going to have a reading now from Deuteronomy chapter 28. It's a, a really a, a terrifying reading, but it's truth, and the truth will set us free. And this is a reading from Deuteronomy. But if you do not hearken to the voice of the Lord your God and are not careful to observe all his commandments, which I enjoin on you today, all these curses shall come upon you and overwhelm you. The Lord will put a curse on you, defeat and frustration in every enterprise you undertake until you are speedily destroyed and perish for the evil you have done in forsaking me. The Lord will bring a pestilence upon you that will persist until he has exterminated you from the land you are entering to occupy. The Lord will strike you with wasting and fever, with scorching, fiery draught, with blight and searing wind that will plague you until you perish. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I had mentioned, brothers and sisters, that reading was uh, kind of overwhelming, but it's true. It's true. Let me ask you a real simple question. Uh, do you think God wants you to be sick? Do you think God wants you to be sick? There are people who go around and say, well, I guess this is what God wants for me. I don't believe God wants you to be sick. Now, I'm not saying God can't do wonderful things in any circumstance, including sickness. Of course he can. I'm not saying he can't turn it all to the good for those who love him. He promised he'd do that, and he'll turn sickness to the good. But I don't believe God wants you to be sick. You know why I say that? It's because God's your father. And I don't know any father that loves his children that wants his children to be sick. Oh, we, we need to discipline our children. We need to teach them a lesson. We need to show them they've got to change their ways. We need to talk to these kids. But we don't do it by making them sick. Do you see what I mean? So you might say, well, okay, I understand. If God doesn't want to make me sick and I don't want to be sick, well, then how in the world did I get sick? Who made me sick? How did I get sick? Well, that reading from Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 15 and the following this tells us how we get sick. We get sick because of sin. You know, when God made things, there was no sickness in this world. But then when sin entered this world, and we brought sin into this world, a lot of things came in with sin, like death and like sickness. Like sickness. And so, when we're sick, we're sick because of sin. We're always, we're always sin sick. Do you understand? We are always sin sick. You might say, well, you mean everybody who's sick, they're bad sinners? Not necessarily. I didn't say it was the sin of the person who's sick, although a lot of times it is. But it's certainly the sin of somebody that's causing sickness. Do you understand? Let's look at Deuteronomy 28 now. And it says, if we don't obey God, guess what will happen to us? It says, a pestilence will come upon us. Deuteronomy 28, 21. It says, a wasting and a fever will come upon us. When you get a temperature, where does that come from? From somebody's sin. Very likely your own, but not always. It goes on and it says that, um, verse 27 of Deuteronomy 28, You'll be stricken with boils and tumors and eczema and the itch until you cannot be cured. Even mental illness often is due to the sin of the person and always due to the sin of someone. Verse 28, Deuteronomy 28, 28, the Lord will strike you with madness, blindness, and panic. Do you understand? And that's only part of the wages of sin, which is death and sickness and just devastation. Now, the way to deal with sin and sickness, because sickness is due to sin, is obviously to receive forgiveness. Now, you might say, what if I'm suffering because somebody else is sinning? Well, I guess the best thing for you to do is be a minister of reconciliation. Remember 2 Corinthians chapter 5? And you go and help that person come to the Lord and repent. 
But most of the time, it's not other people only, maybe partially, but most of the time, our own sin has something to do with it. Not all the time. Remember John chapter 9 and verse 3. Uh, this man was blind and the apostle said, I know it's sin. Is it his sin or is it his parents? And Jesus said, in this case, it wasn't either one of them. But it really was sin in the whole world or there would never have been a blind person. But, um, so I'm not saying that you're always the one sinning if you're the one sick. But it happens that way most of the time. At least your sin has a part to play in your sickness. And therefore, how do you deal with the sickness caused by sin? You must repent. You must receive forgiveness from the Lord. When you're sick, you know one of the first things you should do? Go to confession. Go to confession. That's one of the very first things you should do. Maybe I ought to read a little bit about this. this I'm going to read from uh, Sirach. Sirach has some tremendous revelations about what to do when you're sick. Let me find the passage here. Okay. Hmm. Sirach 38, verse 9. My son, when you're ill, what do you do? Delay not. Do something. But what do you do? First, pray to God that he will heal you. Two, flee wickedness. Let your hands be just. Cleanse your heart of every sin. Three, offer your sweet-smelling oblation and petition. And four, give the doctor his place. But remember, number one is pray. Number two is repent. Number three is worship. And number four is the doctor. So, I'd say one of the first things you do is repent. In fact, it's the second thing according to Sirach. Prayer is first, repent is second. And you'll save yourself a lot of money on doctors and a lot of trouble. Remember, before you take a pill, before you get on that phone... Before you even lay down to rest, you repent. You repent. Now, if you refuse to repent and you, your sin is partially the cause of your sickness, guess what? You won't get better. People can pray over you forever. Doctors can give you treatments on treatments and you will not get better. You won't. I'm going to read back and get Sirach. Sirach chapter 3 verse 27. Here's a man, he has a sin, his sin is pride. It says, Sirach 3, 27, For the affliction of the proud man, there is no cure. When a person does not repent, there is no cure for him. Even if they got the littlest cold in the world, if they don't repent, there is no cure for him. Even if they got a hangnail, if they don't repent, there is no cure for him. Do you see what I mean? That's what it says. Let's look at another passage. This is Psalm 32 and verse 3. Psalm 32 and 3. I hope you have your Bibles and you're following along with me or just jot these things down or you can get a copy of this tape just by uh, sending into the address listed. So Sirach 32 verse 3. As long as I wouldn't speak, my bones wasted away. This guy got worse and worse. He kept losing weight and losing weight with my groaning all the day. He was in terrible pain and he kept kept groaning all the time. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. He didn't get any relief. It was just sick all day long, all night long. Sick, sick, sick. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. He got so weak, he could hardly even do anything. Guess what his problem was? He would not admit his sin. He could not get forgiveness because he could not give confession. And he says, then I acknowledged my sin to you. My guilt I covered not. I said, I confess my faults to the Lord. And you took away the guilt of my sin. And I started feeling better all of a sudden as soon as I confessed my sins. You see what it says there? Psalm 32. So when you're sick, first thing to do, or run among the first things to do, confess your sins. Go to confession. All right. Now, there's another thing that goes along with that. And I'm going to look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. That is why we were uh, singing the Our Father before. Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. This is the Lord's Prayer. And in the Lord's Prayer, the Lord teaches us to pray in such a way 
that we will curse ourselves through praying the Lord's Prayer if we have not forgiven people. Because we pray that we would for be forgiven as we forgive those who trespass against us. This is repeated in Matthew 6, verse 14. If you forgive the faults of others, your heavenly Father will forgive you yours. But, now listen to this, if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive you. Do you see what I mean? If you don't forgive you won't be forgiven. And if you won't be forgiven, then you won't get healed. So you see what I mean? You see how healing depends on you receiving forgiveness, but receiving forgiveness depends on you giving forgiveness. And therefore, one of the major blocks, and I find this to be true, I would say 90% or more of the time, that most problems, including health problems, go back to an unforgiveness. The person does not forgive someone else. And when you don't forgive someone else, I'm telling you, your healing is blocked. You don't expect to get healed. Look at Sirach 28. We're in Sirach again. Sirach 28, 3. It says, Should a man nourish anger against his fellows and expect healing from the Lord? If you think you can be mad at somebody and expect to get healed, you're wrong. You're absolutely wrong. Remember, um, Matt, I want to read this. This is Mark eleven twenty four. Mark eleven twenty four. 24. You know, how do you get healed? You get healed by faith, don't you? Sure you do. You get healed by faith, but you know what will ruin your faith? Unforgiveness. Look at this. Mark eleven twenty four. I give you my word. If you're ready to believe, if you got faith, if you're ready to believe that you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer, it shall be done for you. Did you hear that again? If you're ready to believe, it shall be done for you. If you're ready to believe that cancer is gone, it's gone. If you're ready to believe that that person in the, in the de deathbed is going to come out, then you're going to come out. But of course, God will have to give you that faith. When God gives you that kind of faith, I'm telling you, you're ready. But you know, you won't get the faith God wants you to have unless you're forgiving. The very next verse, very next verse, Mark 11, 25, when you stand to pray, when you stand to pray the prayer of faith, guess what? Forgive anyone, anyone against whom you have a grievance that your heavenly Father may in turn forgive you your faults. If you didn't realize what it says in Mark, Matthew 6, you wouldn't understand why are these two things put together, but they are put together. If you don't have forgiveness for other people, your prayer power and your prayer of faith power is ruined, is ruined. Remember Matthew 5:24. it says, you go to the altar. If you think anybody has anything against you, you'll just have to leave your gift at the altar and go and be reconciled. I'm telling you, you come to the altar, you're going to have to leave your healing at the altar and go be reconciled. I'm telling you, there's so many healings left at the altar and people have not come back and pick them up because they haven't gone out and got reconciled. You know, a lot of times when people come up and say, Oh, Father, I want you to pray for me. I want you to do something for me to help me. I'm very sick. Uh, I think some of the time the best thing to tell that person is, I can't do a thing. Just leave it right here at the altar. And you go and forgive your husband first. You come right back here and you'll be healed before you even get here. You see what I mean? You see how this works? Not only does unforgiveness block being forgiven and therefore being healed, it actually makes you worse. It not only keeps you from getting better, it gets you worse. If you've got cancer and you're not forgiving and you stay that way, you're going to get worse cancer. Now, the reason I say that is because of Matthew chapter 18 and verse 34. Matthew 18, 34, this man was forgiven a tremendous debt and then he did not forgive a fellow servant who owed him just a little something. And the master said to this unforgiving servant, and he said, uh, I'm going to hand you over to the torturers until you pay back what you owe. You know, if we don't forgive, we are handed over to the torturers. Now, the torturers are not people. They're worse than people. The torturers are resentment, unforgiveness, loneliness, anxiety, all kinds of depression and confusion. And that is a... Uh, really a life of hell on earth. So I think you get the idea. We've got to forgive each other to be forgiven, to be healed. Now, let me say one more thing about this. You've heard the expression, to err is human. To forgive 
is divine. You're human, I'm human. If to urge human, we can do that fine. If to forgive is divine, we can't do that fine because we're not divine. So I think you have to admit the fact, say, Lord, I can't forgive. I don't have it in me. I don't have the power. I just don't have it. You have to be divine to forgive, and I'm not divine. How can I forgive? And the Lord says, I'm glad you understand that you're going to need a Savior, aren't you? So you come before the Lord and say, I can't forgive, but I can ask for a miracle, and you're going to do it. And the Lord certainly will. Now, one other thing related to forgiveness and unforgiveness, and this is the area of guilt. Sometimes, I'm talking about false guilt. Sometimes true guilt just means you've never repented. But once you repent and you have been forgiven and forgiving and you still have guilt, that's false guilt because it's not real. It's just something you have believed that is a lie. Of course, guilt will often ruin a person receiving healing. Now, how do you deal with guilt? You tell somebody about it. Now, you say, I can't do that. If, they, if I told them that, I wouldn't have a friend in the world. That's not true. And in order to unmask the lie, you must challenge the lie. You must call the devil's bluff. What does it say in James 5, 16? It says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may find healing. See, confessing our sins to one another uh, challenges the devil's lie about us being so bad and which, on which he, he builds this, this whole experience of guilt that he's putting on us. You know, and if, unless we can call the devil's bluff, you know, this guilt just piles up and piles up. Now, occasionally, a person will say, I have repented and I have even declared my sins to another I did it in the sacrament of confession to the priest, and I still feel guilty. Well, then, there's another problem there. The problem is uh, something's wrong with your relationship to the Heavenly Father. That's the problem. Like in Luke 15, 20, and the following, remember the prodigal son coming back to the forgiving father? And the father says, I want you to know that I've forgiven you. I throw my arms around you. I kiss you. I put the finest robe on you. I kill the fatted calf. I put the ring on your finger, the shoes on your feet. I want to let you know that you're my son. I love you. You're forgiven. You don't have to carry that guilt around anymore. Well, the, the boy didn't believe it at first. And he said, oh, I'm not worthy to be your son. Just let me be a hired hand. Do you see what I mean? So if guilt persists after declaring our sins to one another, then there's a problem with the relationship with the Father. Children are, are notorious for not being guilty. Sometimes you wish they were a little more guilty. You know, they got guilty for about five minutes, and that's the end of that. And they just go out and do their own thing and have no problems. Well... Uh, when it, every once in a while you'll see a kid who's guilty, who really carries guilt with them, not just momentarily, but for a long while. That's very unusual. But you know when that happens, it's almost always an indication there's a problem between that child and their parents. When there's a good relationship between child and parent, you'll never see this guilt build up. Okay, we talked about three things. We've got to forgive in order to be healed because sickness is based on sin and how do you deal with sin? You deal with it by receiving re forgiveness. But you can't get forgiven unless you forgive others. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And the devil even throws in another little wrench into the whole healing process by having people who already have forgiven and are forgiving and they still get their healing blocked because of guilt. But your relationship with your father, your obeying of the Bible and declaring your sins to one another, uh, your calling the devil's bluff will dissipate that guilt. And there comes the healing, just flowing in. The, the, the sin is removed. The unforgiveness is removed. The guilt is removed. The healing just floods into your body, into your heart, into your mind, and you are a healed and a whole person. All right? Well, we're going to pray about this now. Isn't this wonderful what God wants to do for us? 
Why don't you just maybe put your hands out, if you would, as a sign of, I want to receive, Lord. Lord, I confess my sins. Each person watching this program confesses his or her sins and says, Lord, forgive me. I'll go to confession as soon as possible and receive your forgiveness in the sacrament of reconciliation. Heal me right now. Lord, if unforgiveness is blocking me being forgiven and me being healed, Lord, by your divine power, give me the grace to forgive. Lord, if guilt is burdening me, I just declare my sins openly, calling the devil's bluff. And I say, Abba, Father, Holy Spirit, cry out in me, Abba, Father, may I trust my dad when he says, you are forgiven. Brothers and sisters, you're forgiven, you're free, you're healed. In Jesus' most precious, powerful, and holy name.